So welcome to the Lower East Side Girls Club. Thanks for coming. Some of you have been sitting around patiently for a while tonight. I hope you all come back for the Space Apps Challenge all weekend, Friday uh, and then Saturday through Sunday. Uh, if you have any, any questions about the Girls Club, you can ask me. Or you can ask Lynn, who's sitting back in the back. There she is. Uh, she's really the driving force with, with her team of the, getting this building built, and we've been here five years. So our plan tonight is to go upstairs first to the planetarium, uh, and Micah's going to show... Where's Micah? Oh, you're right in front of me. Huh? Micah's going to show us uh, Open Space, the new software that he and Carter Emmert and some other uh, coders, programmers uh, have put together. And then we're going to come back down and he'll do more technical dive into it. It'll be easier to see the, uh, the whole interface and uh, configurations uh, down, back down here. So we'll do a quick blip upstairs. You can see that. And since there aren't that many folks here, if uh, once we're done with both of the sessions, uh, we'll we can do a quick tour of a couple of other places in the building. You can kind of get a preview of what's going to be happening this weekend. Okay, cool. Let's go upstairs. Everyone is looking at the moon right now. Hopefully uh, you recognized that. Um, and then uh, I'll just wait like another one minute to see if people are still coming in. Uh, and maybe we will zoom out. So, um, some of you maybe have seen open space before. Some of you maybe have seen software like it before. Uh, but then maybe some of you haven't. So, um, you know, a little bit about open space, which I'll talk more about what it is and how it came to be and all of that later when we're downstairs. But basically, you know, we are showing the space, we are showing the solar system, we are showing the galaxy, we are showing the universe. And uh, basically everything that you see in here is data driven. And that's one of the big things of open space is that um, you know, we are not uh, artists creating models and stuff uh, for Hollywood movies, but rather we are uh, trying to visualize science through uh, cutting edge techniques and data visualization. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so basically, I'm going to do mostly in the solar system here, and then we'll leave a little bit. So uh, we're starting out at Earth, Moon, and the Earth-Moon system. Here you can see the orbits of uh, the Earth around the Sun and the Moon around the Earth. If I want, I can easily um, I can go here to my virtual properties, show the trails, hide the trails. So you know, maybe you want to do something without those orbit lines. You can just turn them right off. Um, so uh, we'll start just. I will focus on the Earth, and we will zoom into it. So one of the things about open space is uh, about our navigation model is that uh, you always have to be looking at something. So space is very large, and if you let people just fly around, they get lost because it's really hard to find things, especially if something like the trails are off, right? How many people can see the moon right now? Probably not, and if I zoom out, you won't be able to see the Earth. So you always are focused on something, and then you can orbit and look at that thing. So you can orbit around it. So I can go around the Earth. I can tilt my look. But um, the Earth is what we're looking at right now, and we're actually looking at um, the weather that is loaded from a satellite from NASA. And it's uh, one of the features of our globe browsing module, which I'm going to talk a lot about later, is the ability to add in these different layers of data. So uh, the version that we have right now, it's showing the weather loaded for each day. And then as you would zoom into the Earth, the weather would go away. And if I was over land somewhere, the land would appear. Unfortunately, there's a lot of ocean on our planet. So I seem to be always over an ocean. Um, but we, uh, our uh, map 
data set for the Earth comes from Esri, and um, you know it's similar to something that you would see in Google Earth, where as you zoom in, it's loading higher resolution uh, versions of the tiles that you're seeing, and um, it combines the imagery with a digital elevation model to uh, create a texture and a uh, model for the surface so that when there's mountains you can see mountains and see the relief so right here we're looking at the earth and a map of the earth that is provided by esri however we can do the same thing on other planets we can do the same thing on the moon we can do the same thing on mars and I think that we'll spend a little bit more time looking at that rather than the surface of the Earth because hey, you guys are on the Earth, you've been there, you might have seen Google Earth, you might have seen some pictures of the Earth before, but you've probably seen less of the Moon and Mars. Um, you'll notice that maybe the Earth wasn't up. We always talk about what is up really though. So I'm going to zoom us out and take us to the Moon. We're going to look at the moon and talk about some of the data that we have on the moon. So if I go to the moon, I'm focusing on the moon and then I will travel there. So here we are. So our moon is uh, shaded right now by the, the shadow of uh, the light from the sun is uh, showing. However, often when we're trying to show the moon, we kind of... Uh, want to show uh, the whole thing, right? We don't want to be like uh, constricted by what uh, what is really happening out there. So I can easily do things like this. And uh, maybe downstairs later, I will show how to use these menus and stuff. You know, another thing I could do if I wanted uh, is that I can control time. So if I did want to see a portion of the moon but still maintain uh, the shading that we have here, I can actually just move time around and if I go fast enough, we will see that, you know, it, based on where the sun is, the lighting changes on the surface. And so, you know, uh, for certain visual effects, you will need that. So what you're looking at right now is, is a, a global mosaic of the moon. This is the imagery that was taken by the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it was taken by its wide angle camera. So uh, that mosaic was then put together uh, into what we call a geotiff, which is an image file that has uh, geographic coordinates built into it. And I will talk a little bit more about that later as well. And then it is also embedded into the TIFF different levels of resolution. So as you see here, as I zoom in, the resolution will load in higher and higher detail depending on where you are. So I'm going to zoom in, and then that will load up. And just depending on your connection, it will load faster or slower. And then you can also um, enable caching, which I'll talk about later, so that when you've already downloaded the tiles, the tile will be there on your computer. So the imagery was coming from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and its narrow angle camera. But you'll notice, combined with the imagery, we also have a digital elevation model. So that is the height of the surface of the planet at any given location. This one that you're looking at came from the, uh, the LOLA, the Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter. So basically they're just going around shooting a laser altimeter down from the craft. And you know, when it comes back, you can imagine how it works. Uh, if it comes back quicker, the surface is taller. And if it comes back slower, the surface is not as tall. Um, so, these, uh, the elevation model is loaded in as well. So these uh, layers that you're looking at are uh, loaded in over the internet. Uh, basically, we take a web server and we have it serve up the tiles and it can um, chunk out the image based on X, Y coordinates and then open space as we browse around the globe will ask for the image at this X, Y coordinate and uh, then render it. So um, we have a series of global maps for each planet. Uh, different planets have different ones that are of, uh, you know, some of the planets that we don't have all this data for, we just show an image and we don't have all the data when we do. Uh, so here I was just turning on another one. However, uh, 
it's going to take a second to load in, so I won't even bother with that guy. Um, so uh, we have a certain amount of imagery that we bundle with open space, and these are these layers like this one you're looking at that will load in. However, we also can uh, locally include on to the computer running open space um, high resolution patches of um, data that is either too big to be streamed over the internet or is specific and we don't necessarily want it to bundle with the whole piece. So what I'm turning on now, which is like very hard to see if you don't know where it is, but as I will go in, we will, it will show up. So what I'm going to turn on is a local layer of the Apollo 15 landing site. So uh, whereas the global mosaic of the moon that you're looking at was loaded uh, over the web, this local patch of the Apollo 15 landing site is actually existing on disk on this computer. It's the same TIFF file, or a similar TIFF file, only rather than being chunked out by a web server and served to us over the internet, it exists here and OpenSpace is able to load the whole file at once. So that's why I can turn it off and turn it on and the image is instantly available. It has the advantage of you don't have to wait, uh, but you know, it's, um, it, they are a lot larger and we have uh, for various different portions of different planets, we have uh, an exorbitant number of gigabytes of these files. So uh, we don't bundle them all with the default installation and it's up to you to then go and download uh, extra parts. So one of the things that I'll be talking about later is how does this show up? Um, and how, how does OpenSpace know to look for this? And how is OpenSpace able to render it? And what type of information do you have to provide? So uh, I won't actually like give the whole spiel about like what, when they landed and what, where they went and all these different things and this lava channel and stuff. But what I will just try to briefly do is show this script that we're looking at was taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter narrow angle camera. So you can see it's much higher resolution than the, uh, than the imagery around it. And it's so high resolution that we are able to actually see the lunar lander on the surface of the moon here. So I've kind of got it right at the, towards the bottom of the dome. And you can see this um, black spot here. And then now you can, as I get closer, you can actually see these trails. So this is uh, where they landed, and then the trails over to the rover and the science experiment. Um, so y you can uh, use this feature of the globe browsing to provide um, more details about specific portions of the body that you are trying to present about. So whereas here, if we were giving a presentation and showing stuff about the Apollo, we might show this landing site and we might talk about what they did and where they went. Um, maybe later you want to give a presentation about the geology of the moon and how things were formed. So you might want to include a layer that shows the chemical composition of the surface, or you might want to show a layer that shows the colorized relief. And one of the things that I'm going to show later is how to download a strip like this, process it, and then uh, make it show up on the globe. Um, so uh, basically, um, the globe browsing is a very kind of a compelling feature that we have of open space because it provides something that's feel, uh, familiar to people. They understand planets and mountains and things like that. And, uh, they're kind of used to looking at the moon, so everybody really enjoys the globe browsing. Um, so adding new uh, layers and new data and information to globes is a really, um, is a thing that we do a lot for our presentations, and I imagine it's something that people will do for the hackathon. So um, I will just maybe just show a little bit of globe browsing on Mars uh, as well, just because it's nice, but I don't really want to spend too long um, talking more about a different instance of the same feature. So uh, on Mars, we have uh, more maps than we do even for the moon, and we have higher resolution imagery for some parts of the moon. So here again, you are looking at the 
wide angle camera. This mosaic was created with the wide angle camera and then I can turn on various different layers of different that were made with different cameras. So now I'll turn on this one which was created with the context camera. And you can see with this map we actually only have 70% of the surface um, created but this map is uh, has six meters per pixel resolution. And yeah, you can start seeing some of these channels and stuff and uh, it will load in a higher detail as you approach the surface. Um, <clears throat> for Mars, again, we have many uh, global maps that are loaded over the web. And then we also have uh, some local patches that would just, uh, you can turn on and they're there instantly. Uh, I actually don't know this one that I just turned on where it's located. So, oh, there, there it is. So if you see this one, I have this one shows up immediately because it actually lives there on disk. This local patch was actually created by uh, a set of high school students that we had working on um, processing this data. I will talk a little bit about how this patch was created. It was done with a little more complex process than the one I'm going to show, but uh, it was created from the raw images downloaded from NASA's PDS. And when I turn on the surrounding mosaic, you can see it kind of fit in. Um, so the globe browsing is really kind of an awesome part of open space and uh, I expect that a certain amount of people involved in the hackathon will use it. Um, I would like to now just kind of exit it and, and talk a little bit about some of the other data that we bring in and features. So, Are there other bodies uh, other than planets, you mean? Yes. So uh, that's a great question. So right now, like, we only have planets that you're going to see. However, um, one of the other features of open space is the mission visualization. And so um, for something like the uh, Rosetta mission, I believe it was the Rosetta mission, uh, where they went and they visited an asteroid, uh, we had then, as part of that mission visualization, have the asteroid, and we have the model of it, and then what we have is the uh, pictures that it was taking projected onto the model of it. Uh, so it's actually a great segue into the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which was the NASA SPICE data. One of the big parts of the open space is, is how we use NASA's SPICE data. So this is their data that they uh, generate about where all their spacecraft are and what they're doing, but it also um, gives us the positions of the planets and any bodies. So uh, whereas you see Mars right now and you see its orbit lines, and then when we zoom out, you can see other planets. The, the way that open space decides where, um, where these things go is by taking the data from NASA and using it to position it uh, over time in 3D space. And so if we wanted to bring in other bodies other than planets, we could use, if NASA has data about where those bodies are, we could use that. Um, we also have some other ways of positioning elements in 3D space that I can talk about uh, when I'm downstairs later because somebody else asked about that as well. Um, so I'm going to now uh, take us to Mercury and show a couple things that we showed in a presentation a few months ago at the Hayden. Um, so uh, here we go. Oh, it's already turned on. That is great. I will actually just turn it off, though. Uh, so here we are at Mercury, and you're actually seeing these blue lines. So what are these blue lines? So this blue line is the orbit trail of the Messenger spacecraft. And uh, if I focus on Messenger, we should actually be able to go and zoom in and see the spacecraft. So both the spacecraft along with these orbit lines are generated using the SPICE data. So here we are, we have a model of the spacecraft and we have it positioned. So uh, the, the system clock of my computer, well not the system clock of my computer, but open space's clock is actually set to May 11th 
uh, May 17th, 2011 right now, because that was the time when Messenger was orbiting Mercury. And if I go forward or back in time, we can see it move around this orbit. Um, so let me actually, I don't think I will actually do that now because it, it might mess with our camera angles if I didn't set it up right. Um, so here, um, if I zoom out a little bit, so uh, the way, here's Mercury, and then we have our orbit around it, and we have our spacecraft, and one of the things that I will talk about uh, downstairs is how do we bring, how do we bring spacecraft in, and how do we um, not only show it, but position it and tell open space where it is and what it's doing. Um, so. Uh, the presentation that we gave about Mercury was about this messenger spacecraft and about different data that it collected. So um, we showed the craft and we showed its orbit and we showed it coming in and orbiting um, Mercury. And then we also showed some high resolution patches of Mercury that uh, where we went to the surface and just like on the moon and Mars, we can go and we can browse the surface. We have our loaded map layer, which um, which is loaded over the internet, but then again, the same thing. We had local, um, we had local patches, and then I believe that for Mercury, maybe I can also there's Mars, Mercury. Maybe I can turn on one of the other maps because we had some maybe colored ones. So let's see if this guy wants to show up. So here we have uh, added in a magnesium map. So this is the uh, composition of mercury. Uh, this is the abundance of uh, mercury well, on the planet Mer magnesium on the planet Mercury. So you can see the red parts are where mercury is more abundant, the blue parts is where it's less abundant. And this is the type of data that you can bring in and use uh, in open space. So the, this data was previously not in open space before we gave the presentation. Uh, we worked with our planetary geologist who was our co-presenter and he provided me these maps and in five minutes I was able to put them in. So his maps were actually just JPEGs that were um, uh, projected in a, in a equa rectangular fashion. And so they're able to just map right onto our sphere and you can see some of them are missing data in certain places. But this is an example of an easy thing to kind of bring in and add in and it really uh, adds to the science visualization and it's, that's uh, the idea of some of the stuff I'll be showing. So those were some of the colorized maps that we had added. And then another cool thing that we added was the magnetosphere of Mercury. So that was what was on when I first came in here. So let me turn this on and let me zoom us out. So here is the magnetosphere of Mercury. It's rendered as a volume and it's rendered using our volume rendering module. One of the reasons that I wanted to show this was to give a, an example that I could then talk about later about how different types of data are rendered using different modules inside of open space. So this volume rendering of the magnetosphere uses our volume rendering module. It's actually quite interesting because uh, aside just from like looking cool, um, there is some interesting science that can be uh, determined from the visualization of the magnetosphere. So one of the interesting things, so uh, first off you're seeing that it's, the, it's being pushed away from the sun by the solar wind. So here, you know, if you look at where the sun is with Mercury, it's, it, you can, it's pretty clear that it's pushing it away. But then you also see this interesting pinch that's happening in the north and south poles. And if I, maybe if I zoom in, you can see it. You can actually like see it above and below. There's like a, it looks like someone's fingers are kind of pinching it. And that's, uh, I don't even remember what the explanation was from the planetary geologist, but basically something about its poles. Then another interesting thing which you could, which we, uh, we actually had to adjust some parameters of the visualization to see. So I'm not sure if it's, I'm able to uh, appear, if you're able to see it here, but basically there is a, a disk that forms behind the planet, like a plane um, of a higher concentration of magnetic activity that 
it, it was like theorized, and then when the measurements came in, it was uh, they had discovered it, and then when we did the visualization, you could see it, and so um, there is interesting stuff to be either uh, demonstrated or proved through the visualizations. Um, okay, so we saw some globe browsing. Um, we saw this interesting magnetosphere, and we looked at some of the ships. So let's now kind of zoom out, and let's maybe leave the solar system for a moment. So um, basically, um, we could go visit any of the planets in the solar system, but only uh, Mars, Earth, and Mercury right now actually have um, like globe browsing layers and maps that are built into them. So now we are going to zoom out, and um, once we get to one light year away, the, our sun just turns into a star like the rest. And now um, I'm zooming out, and we can start seeing the stars in our local group. So uh, I'm actually just going to turn them up a little bit, because uh, I had done this previously here, but I'm launching a different scene, which didn't have my setting of them turned up. One of the things that we do in open space is based on the dome and the lighting. We might adjust different parameters to make certain things more visible and certain things less visible because uh, based on the contrast ratio of your screen or your projector, etc., cetera, um, different uh, things have to be adjusted because so that you can actually see what's going on. So here we're looking at a lot of stars. So uh, one of the things, so this again is data that is represented. So uh, we have our digital universe catalog, which is created by AMNH. The, uh, all these stars came from there. Uh, and it provides the positions, the colors, and many other various properties. Uh, one of the things that I will just uh, talk about downstairs as an example is how uh, someone can bring in different data sets of stars. So this is our default one that we ship with, which was uh, compiled and created by um, some astrophysicists at the Museum of Natural History. But there are other ones, and maybe you want to show them. Uh, one of the real interesting uh, new features that has been put into open space, is not in this version, but I'll talk about it later, is the new Gaia Data Release 2 data set, which has 1.7 billion stars in it, released by ESA. And uh, we have someone that was working on rendering that, and we have a really interesting and compelling version of uh, rendering the Gaia database. So, uh, so we could spend some time looking and talking about the stars. I, you know, some of you guys might know more about some of these stars than I do. Um, and but if we zoom out away from the stars, um, I will actually zoom out. Uh, Actually, before I zoom out here, let me turn on two of these things. So the focus is still the sun, and actually, I am actually gonna um, actually exit us and relaunch for a second because I am uh, when I loaded up the Mercury magnetosphere earlier, I actually loaded up a version that does not have the rest of the galaxy in it. So uh, this is a great kind of a example of some of the stuff that I'm going to show later about how you set up what is in your scene and what is, uh, what is showing on the screen in open space. Basically, uh, you saw a couple different things, but we, ha uh, we have lots of data, and we have lots of modules, and we have lots of capabilities, and we don't always load up all of the capabilities into the scene at once. So that was actually the scene that I had made for the Messenger program, so we didn't actually load up the rest of the galaxy in it because we were not going beyond the stars of our solar system, uh, well, beyond our solar system even, much less the stars of our galaxy. So now that I have this other version loaded up, I could show maybe some other interesting things like Briefly, I will just show the constellations because later I'm going to give an example of how these are, are shown on the screen and use its asset files as an example. So here are the constellations. You know, I don't really need to talk about them too much. You guys know what they are. 
you know, people get interested when you zoom away from the constellations and you can see them move, right? Because they're made up of stars of various magnitudes. Um, and then I'll just kind of turn that off. Okay, so now we were gonna go, um, another interesting thing to turn on, a, a data point is this equatorial sphere. So this is what we call the radio sphere. This is supposed to represent, um, you know, how far our radio signals have traveled since they were able to uh, emanate past our atmosphere. I could do something like uh, interesting, which is turn on the star labels here. So you could actually see which stars will have received our radio signals or not. Uh, and I can later talk about how these star labels show up. So I will turn that off. And now I'm going to go into the universe turn on some galaxies, and we can go and see the galaxies. Uh, so as I zoom away, uh, our those are the stars in our local galaxy area, and then we kind of zoom away to the uh, um, image of our galaxy. As you might guess, this is not actually an image of our galaxy because um, we're not able to take pictures of our galaxy yet. So this is one that is similar to the galaxy. I forget what name it is, but it's one that uh, we think is the, looks very much like ours. So as I zoom out, you're seeing these dots appear. These Each dot is now representing a galaxy. And what you're seeing is uh, data from the Tully Galaxy Survey, uh, which is one of the galaxy surveys that's included by default in open space. We include about 10 different galaxy surveys. Uh, I believe that I'm only going to turn on two right now. Um, so, you know, again, I don't actually need to tell you about how many stars are in each galaxy and how many galaxies are in da da da. Um, I'm going to talk more about how this gets in there. So, uh, basically, the galaxy surveys are working similar to the star surveys. We have what we call a spec file, which describes their positions in space and uh, some of the other properties associated with them. So as I go away from that galaxy survey and I zoom out, you see another galaxy survey coming in. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is, uh, I believe, to be our most uh, detailed survey of the galaxies. Uh, it has the interesting kind of data point of why is there stuff missing on the sides? Well, that's because we can't see out there. Why is there more on the top and the bottom? That's because we have more telescopes in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting things about this uh, survey uh, in terms of bringing it into open space and, and the data is that this is one of the ones we have that fades in and out as you zoom in and out. So that way, it, in the asset file that includes the galaxies, you could say, and only show this when you are this many parsecs away from the sun. So that way, it, you can have it on and not have all these things in front of your face when you're zoomed in, but then when you zoom out, it naturally appears. Uh, past the galaxies is the quasars, which again have a similar thing where when I go away, they show up. Uh, one of the things that we actually have to work on is that the what you're looking at is a fisheye rendering of open space, uh, which actually renders four view planes and then combines them. And uh, it turns out that the camera position uses one of the view planes instead of an average of them. And so this guy doesn't actually fade in as soon as we want it to when you're viewing this type of rendering. And I'll talk a little, I just wanted to bring that up so that um, when I'm downstairs and I'll talk about uh, the configuration file and some of our different methods of rendering. So the last part of our kind of universe uh, example is just to turn on the cosmic microwave background, which, you know, again, like uh, maybe some of you guys could even describe it better than I could, but uh, we have that here kind of mapped around our image of the visible universe, and you can adjust uh, everything that you're seeing. You can kind of adjust these properties of transparency and brightness, and many different assets have different types of uh, adjustments that could be made. And later, when we look at the asset files, we will see how those adjustments are specified and how uh, which different types of things have which types of settings and adjustments that can be made. Um, so now we're going to kind of zoom back in. Um, 
one of the features I'll just mention briefly downstairs and I can link to some papers about it is, you know, basically this concept of a dynamic scale of our scene graph because um, we just traveled, you know, a, an exorbitant amount, an exorbitant distance that is unfathomable, but it looked like we were traveling the same speed as we are now when we were traveling a much smaller distance, which is still pretty uh, large, I would say. Um, and so, you know, that was actually the uh, the topic of a, a scientific paper about how we handle this in traveling, both traveling between distances, but also uh, positioning things at certain distances. So how could um, you be on the surface of Mars or the surface of the moon and uh, be calculating the precision uh, positions of something on the surface of the moon and then at the same time uh, be seeing the stars in the background and calculating the position of the stars because the level of precision that you would need is, is uh, would vary as the distances grow. So we have to uh, deal with things in an um, interesting dynamic fashion. Uh, that's not really a detail that you will need to know when you're trying to hack things into hack things into open space. But um, I wanted to give it as an example of uh, some of the kind of research that is done through open space in terms of data visualization. Um, so I kind of just brought us back to the moon and um, that was kind of uh, most of the things I was going to show um, because basically what I want to do next is when we go downstairs talk about all the different things we saw and how they came into open space and how you guys can bring things like them into open space using either the same modules or uh, different ones. Um, so if anyone has any questions or something they'd like to see in here, now would be a time to ask or say. Uh, otherwise, we'll go back downstairs. I had a question on the question. Yeah. So I was just wondering, um, is this to scale the moon's distance, for example, to the Earth? Yes. Why don't you repeat the question first? So, the, yeah, the, thank you. Yeah, the question was, is the moon's position to the Earth to scale? And so, uh, I guess I would, like, maybe challenge you by saying, what exactly do you mean by to scale? But I can tell you that it's accurate, right? So, when you say to scale, what does, which scale are we talking about, right? Uh, but it is... Uh, where it is, it's uh, in our scene is accurately placed, you know, whatever, 500,000 miles or uh, kilometers. I don't remember exactly what the distance is. But uh, the, that, that scale and that uh, distance is um, provided by the NASA SPICE data, which is uh, their ephemeris data of where things are and when. Um, but we, uh, so yeah, so I mean, it's, it's accurate. Scale is an interesting concept when you're talking about these large distances. A question um, just related to that. So you have um, satellites and spacecraft out there. Are yeah. those also displayed to scale so you have to fly very close to it to see it and then scale down the Yes. So I would say that, like, um, yes, the spacecraft are positioned in that scale as well in terms of it, you have to get very close in order to see it. You know, I'm, I'm often, like, flying through space, and one of the things that you'll see downstairs is on the interface, it tells you how far you are from the target. So I will fly to go to a spacecraft, and I'm like, I see that, oh, I'm only 300 kilometers away. I'm super close to it. Why aren't I seeing it? And then I'm like, oh, right, like, this thing's smaller than a car. You can't see it from 300 kilometers away. Um, and so you do have to get close to it. What I would say about the, the reason I hesitated when you first asked about the scale of the spacecraft is that you know, one of the kind of important things to get right when bringing in a spacecraft is the initial scale of the model. So 
um, if you were to take that model, enlarge it in Blender, re-export it, then it would be larger in open space. And so you do have to get that initial scale of the model correct, and then from there, it will uh, open space will handle the rest. Could you, like you said, you, you could dynamically change the light that you're shining on the moon just to see more of it. Yeah. Like not correct. Um, when we see the space station from from the surface of the Earth, it's lit by the sun, and and we're looking up maybe 200 miles, you know, 300 kilometers or so. So maybe if there was an, uh, can you say I'm going to artificially light the space? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yes, so our, um, one of the things that we added recently into our asset files, and I'll show this when I show one of the spacecraft asset files, is um, a light sources property. So uh, right now, we might just have two available, uh, basically lit from the sun or lit from the camera. And then you can choose, uh, basically we had to put it in for this exact reason because we were demoing showing the spacecraft and because of how we wanted to show the surface of the planet, then the spacecraft was dark. And it was like, well, we don't want to have to move time to jump between the da-da-da. So we'd like the option of being able to light the spacecraft from the camera instead of the sun. And so that's something we added, I think, really just about three months ago. Why don't we answer some of these questions downstairs? So yeah. Sounds like they're... Perfect, yeah. They're more... Exactly. Um, yeah, because I will be showing some of the files and how exactly, I'll show exactly how that happens. Uh, okay, so thank you for uh, touring the universe in maybe a little more technical fashion than we normally give. Um, and now let's uh, go downstairs where I will talk about how some of the stuff that you saw um, came to be. It's just... So you were going to ask, like, how does it compare? Yeah, I haven't used that. So, yeah, I mean, there is um, a, a variety of different software like this. Some that are very similar, some that are just similar in some ways, you know? Um, one of the things that was interesting to me when joining this project was about a month or two after I joined the project, I saw NASA's eyes on the solar system. I don't know if you guys have seen that. But it actually um, functions similar to open space, and it has some of the similar data, and it has some of the similar visualizations as open space does. And I said to myself, wait, that are we competing with these guys? And then I realized, well, wait, no. NASA paid us to make open space, and they paid JPL to make that. So, like, why did they pay two different companies, to, or two different people to make two different things that are so similar? And then I kind of realized, well, you know, we have some really big differences, even though you, at first glance, they might be similar. But, like, for example, one of the big features of open space is the, the like, variable configuration. And what I mean there is that we... Uh, have built it to run on a variety of mediums. So uh, open space works in planetariums. Eyes on the solar system does not. So there is like a huge difference, right? So some software might be the same, but maybe he works in planetariums and maybe he doesn't, right? Um, you know, another thing is like they have less precision because it's less about science and more about education. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there is... Uh, I've been seeing various different suites of software. You know, another uh, really amazing difference, uh, which will be the first point of one of my slides, is that we're open source. And so um, being open source is really just uh, kind of sets you apart from every other piece of software because of, you know, you could take it and do whatever you want with it and change it in any way that suits you. You know? Um, okay, so maybe I'm good to go ahead and just start here. Everyone, looks like everyone's here. Um, so, yeah, so now I'm going to talk to you guys about um, how some of what you saw came into open space and then how you can bring similar or different things into open space. So, um, 
I made like a basic presentation, but basically I don't want to like, I will go through the presentation, but I also want to show during the presentations examples of what I'm talking about. And then after the presentation, I thought I would do one or two examples of just literally downloading something new off of the internet, running a few commands and seeing it show up in open space um, because hopefully that's the kind of stuff that you'll be doing during the hackathon. Um, so what is the agenda? I will talk a little bit about open space, a little bit about hacking it, some of the details about the different hacking opportunities that I'll mention, and then at the end we'll give some examples. Um, so as I mentioned, open space is open source. That is kind of a big thing for us, and you know, uh, coming from a computer science background, um, it's something that really attracted me to the project when I was joining it. Um, and you know, it's also uh, I always want to iterate to people that it's a data visualization software. So, what you see comes from real data, and that's kind of a another thing that separates us from other things. Like if you saw Mars on in a movie that probably wasn't created with data collected from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. That was probably some guy sitting in a room making a 3D model of it and then making a picture and then adjusting the picture to fit the model. And, and while that might look really cool, being a visualization from real data is, is something completely different. So uh, Open Space is a NASA funded software. It's a collaboration between a number of universities and organizations. Uh, these are our four main organizations, which is the American Museum of Natural History, Ling Shiping University in Sweden, NYU, and the University of Utah. Uh, we also have some other informal science partners, other museums and uh, institutions that are using open space, but these are the main, um, the main organizations involved, and we actually have developers working at each place. Um, so it was created for visualizing cutting edge science in a variety of mediums, such as planetariums. This is one of the things I mentioned. Open space runs in a planetarium. It also runs on your computer on your flat screen. It also runs on a touch table with a touch interface. It also runs on a Oculus Rift or a HTC Vive in VR. Um, and so uh, one of the parts of open space is our windowing framework and that allows us to work in very different environments. Um, so you can find out more about open space kind of on our website and about the institutions. It was started almost five years ago. We got our grant about three years ago when NASA saw our visualization of the New Horizons mission. Uh, maybe that's something I can load up later. Uh, so we're actually on year three of a five-year grant right now, and we're hoping that uh, in two years when the grant is complete, we will, it will get renewed. Um, I mentioned it's data visualization, so one of the interesting things about open space is that it's not only is it a platform for visualizing this data and research, it's also a platform for doing research in data visualization. So each one of our partners there have master's students that do their thesis projects inside of open space, and their thesis project will be to add a new feature to open space. So the globe browsing feature that you saw was a thesis project of two master's students. Uh, later on my computer here, I'll show a rendering of the Martian surface from imagery that was taken by the Curiosity rover. And so those, uh, that visualization, that rendering is done by a set of master's students who just uh, finished their thesis. Um, uh, so some of the key features of open space are our mission visualization, which is uh, basically the concept of, uh, I'll use the New Horizons because that's the one that we got, uh, we got our funding for, but it, not only to show the craft and where it is, but we can also show what it's doing and when. So in the case of New Horizons, it was imaging Pluto. So not only do we see the craft in relation to Pluto, but we can also render the view frustum of the camera as it uh, maps onto the surface of the planet and then see the imagery uh, coming in in real time. Uh, you can adjust the time through our variable time control to see, but so you can see actually how the imagery that we have of Pluto was generated and mapped onto the surface of the planet. So, uh, you know, basically I just mentioned the variable time control. You could 
uh, it's a simulation. So when you are running open space, you are at a specific date and time. And that is how the positions of things are calculated. Basically, we have these files, these SPICE files from NASA that tell us at this time, this thing is here, at this time, this thing is here. Uh, but one of the interesting things about open space is that we have variable time control. So you could uh, progress time at one hour a second. And you can see things zooming around because now we're going much faster. Or maybe you need to progress it at one day a second in order to see the planets orbiting around the sun, right? Um, when we were looking at a visualization of the Gaia stars, one of the interesting data points of the new Gaia data set was um, some of the, the motion, uh, the velocities of the stars. So we were actually able to visualize the motion of the stars in the Milky Way by s turning on the data point of the motion and then progressing time at 500,000 years per second. So imagine every second it's advancing the simulation by 500,000 years and where do these stars go over time? Um, so globe browsing is one that I mentioned uh, is a big feature of ours. Uh, the dynamic scene graph is something I talked about, um, you know, about how that we render things at these various scales. And so um, the, I have a paper later that I can show is just an example of how some of the stuff that we implement and then turns into a research paper about how data visualization can occur and someone could take that research paper and use it. Maybe they want to visualize it, atoms and people. How do they you know, visualize such a different scale of a person versus an atom in, their, in one of their cells, right? So they could use the same visualization technique that we use to render planets and stars to, you know, I, I don't even know if that's a similar scale or not, but it's a, certainly a broad range. Um, I mentioned the multi-configuration display output. That's the concept that we can run on a computer, we can run on a dome, we can run on a table, we can run on a screen, we can just, if you can come up with it, we can run on it, we can run on a fisheye projector, on a regular projector, we can run in two windows, one window, right? And if we don't have that capability, we can add in a new capability. Um, Another interesting feature that I didn't really talk about uh, is the Lua script interactions. So um, the way that our GUI and our menu control works is that every time you press a button, it's actually executing a Lua script. We have a Lua interpreter inside of our, inside of OpenSpace. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Lua is, it's a scripting language similar to Python or JavaScript. It's just another uh, scripting type language. but you can actually use it to control open space. And there's certainly some interesting opportunities to be had there um, in a type of coding that is a little more accessible and easier to approach than the C++ coding that uh, the main modules of open space are developed in. Uh, another interesting feature is this parallel peer. So uh, this is the concept that um, you could be running it here in the planetarium. And uh, there could be a planetarium in LA that is running the same version of the open space software. They can connect to each other and everything that we do here gets mirrored there. And so this concept of you can give kind of a global presentation. So I can be giving the presentation here that software could be running in other domes around the world and they could be seeing the same presentation. And this is a, a really kind of a compelling feature for NASA and for giving these presentations. Um, so uh, I put this slide in just to give kind of a, a simple uh, overview of everything that happens from when I click op to run open space to when you see something on the screen. So basically, um, I just kind of want to run through this so that when we're talking about some of the other uh, features, you'll have an idea of where these things fit in to the pipeline of what's happening. So obviously the first thing you do is you double click it, you launch open space. And then what does that do? It looks for the openspace.cfg file, which is the configuration file. That configuration file tells us which profile are we loading in? Are we loading in a dome? Are we loading on a screen? Are we loading in an Oculus? What is the window resolution? It sets up many other config type of things that I won't even bother like detailing like what folder do you want the log file to go in, what folder do you want your screenshots to be saved in, all sorts of various config typey things and 
we can look at the file later if we want and see what all of those things are, but most of them you don't really need to use. Uh, but an important thing that you specify in the config file is what scene you are showing. So our scene file is the first thing that is read by the open space engine that says what do they want to show. So in the scene file, you add in all the different things you want to show. So you add in the universe, you add in the planets, you add in uh, spacecraft, you add in all these things, you set up different uh, key bindings so that when you press G, it focuses on this guy, and when you press M, it focuses on this guy. And uh, I will demonstrate a scene file later. Uh, the scene file includes many asset files. So every different thing that you saw on the screen has an asset file associated with it. So Earth has an asset file. Moon has an asset file. The Mercury magnetosphere has an asset file. Mercury itself has an asset file. The messenger spacecraft you saw has an asset file. So the scene file includes all these asset files. Uh, the asset files then specify the renderable. So they specify what type of thing is shown by this asset file. So in the case of the planets, it specifies a renderable globe. In case of the uh, spacecraft, it specifies a renderable multi-model geometry. In the case of the magnetosphere, it specifies a rendering time-varying volume. And so each one, we have all these different types of renderables. The asset file says, hey, this is the type of thing I want to show, and here are the properties for it. And then the open space engine goes into our modules and says, hey, you are the module who said that you know how to render renderable globes, so now I'm telling you they want to draw this on the screen. You are the module who said that you can add an atmosphere to a planet, so now I want you to put that on the screen. And so we, uh, one of the key features of open space is this modular architecture, which is the concept that um, we can add new things and new types of features to open space by just adding this new module, then adding uh, some assets that specify renderable types that that module um, knows how to render. And that's how we're able to um, add in new features like adding in a volume or adding in a renderable spacecraft, right? In, the, in our first version, we didn't have renderable spacecraft. Someone made a spacecraft instruments module that registers th uh, that type of thing. So the, I'm going to talk more about the modules and uh, I'll talk a bit about how they are put together and some of our key ones. Um, so uh, basically, um, that is kind of the uh, top-down view of how it works, right? Uh, now, what I have here is about how, how you guys can work on open space and what are opportunities for you to uh, use open space to do something interesting. So, um, the top level, but also kind of the hardest version, is these C++ modules. The C++ modules are what add new functionality, right? So an example of a module is globe browsing. That's our biggest module. That's what lets you go onto the surface of a planet and see it. Another module is the volume module that lets you render that magnetosphere. I don't know if you saw when we were uh, viewing it, but it, it had a really interesting shape to it. That was, that was the data, but it also was rendered inside of a cube, and you could kind of see a little bit about that cube, and that's the way that you render a volume is you have a simulation box, and then you have data that is rendered inside of that box, and so that module handles that. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, but was there when we were on Earth and on Mars was the atmosphere. So we have an atmosphere module that can add an atmosphere to a planet. It's a physics-based simulation of light scattering. I don't even know the details of it because one of our PhD students at NYU spent, that's his like PhD paper on how do you render physics-based uh, atmospheres for scattering the light or et cetera. Uh, but that's an atmosphere module, and so you specify an atmosphere asset, and I think maybe that's one of the ones I'm going to show later. Um, so these modules are what add the functionality. But I would 
expect that most people are not going to be adding new modules to open space because it's the most um, in-depth and involved way to add something and it also requires the most amount of OpenGL and C++ coding ability, right? Um, so we have a number of other options and alternatives and, and basically different avenues that we can use to add things to open space. So one example is our web GUI. So you haven't seen the interface that I was using, but we are also using, a, we are also developing a new interface which will be released in our next version coming in two or three weeks, uh, where we actually have a web browser living inside of open space that is rendered on top of the rendering and it provides a GUI that is based on web technologies. And so if you have done web development, you could add new features to open space by just adding things to our web GUI. Uh, you could also create alternative interfaces using just web technologies and embed them with our, we use the Chromium embedded framework. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, another interesting avenue is our socket API. Well, uh, so this is the concept that we have uh, like a web socket running in open space and you can send and receive data through it. You can use this to create interesting types of interactions, uh, doing something like a Arduino or a different web page or I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, one of the main ways that people add things into open space is just with our assets. So we have existing visualization types, such as spacecraft, globe, atmosphere, all these volumes, things that I've been mentioning. You can add something new into open space that is one of those types by just creating the asset file, saying where all the things live on the hard drive, and then it just shows up. And that's one of the things we're going to show. Um, so the assets are create the globes and the spacecraft. Uh, the globe browsing data is uh, really also another uh, both like compelling and easy way to get stuff into open spaces is the concept of adding those maps to the globe. So whether it's the new global map or just one of those small insets like the Apollo 15 landing site, um, you can, they, these things exist all over the internet. There's, I have a list of like 20 links where you can get these things from and there's like really a lot of interesting stuff. We're adding new things into open space through the globe browsing all the time. Um, and then just another example is like a Spout output. I don't know how many people are doing visual graphics types of things, but basically Spout is this program that lets us take the visuals of open space and send them to another software. And I'll talk about some examples of what you could do with that later. Uh, and then, you know, I kind of wanted to just leave this, of course, because these are some of the avenues that I've identified of here are some easy ways to get things into open space, but really I would hope that maybe you guys think of something else. Hey, I want to do this. Like, do you know how I could get that into open space? Well, yeah, and then we can talk about it and figure out how to get that in. So I would uh, encourage you to not say, oh, I have to do something that's one of these six things. You can do something that's one of these six things, but if you think of something else, it can you know, open space is open source, it's extendable, it's modularized, it pretty much if you can think of it, it's possible. Is it possible in a week in a hackathon? I don't know, but we can talk about that and figure it out. So now to get into some specifics, I'm going to talk about the scenes and the asset files and how they're created. Um, so the, I mentioned the Lua scripting, right? So we have a Lua interpreter in open space. The asset files, when I open them up, they look like text files. Um, they look similar to a JSON file, if you've seen a JSON file before. But the asset files are actually Lua script files. And that does allow us to do some interesting things inside of them. Um, so um, a scene, so the asset files, the scene files, the mission files, the config files, everything is just a Lua script. And our suffix that we add, dot scene, dot asset, that, that kind of tells the system how it's going to be used, right? So the scene file is a top level asset, is a top level file that gets loaded when you first launch open space and it includes a number of assets. It sets different key bindings for that scene. It adds different interesting things onto the dashboard and onto the screen and says to the interface, here are the things that people are going to be using when they're using this scene. So 
uh, when we're giving the example of the Mars rover, the scene file adds in buttons to focus on the rover and Mars, and it doesn't add in buttons to focus on Mercury and the messenger spacecraft, because if you are in the scene for the Mars rover, why would you want a button that easily brings you to looking at the planet Mercury? But when you're in the messenger scene file where you're showing all the data for that, you, wanna, you don't want a button that shows in Mars. Um, you can add some custom configuration and things that happen on the initialize and deinitialize. Uh, so now I thought I would just show the scene file briefly. So uh, here I have the default scene file loaded up. I'll try to make that a little bigger. And then I want to briefly show the default scene file, and then I want to briefly show uh, one of the mission scene files and show how it's slightly different because we've included different things in it. So um, the first thing that we do is we load a couple helper scripts that are used by different files. You, you'll probably just want to put that at the top of your scene file if you're making a new scene. Then you can say, you can see we say, okay, we need to include the spice data because we're going to want to position things. And then this is the default scene, so we're including all this stuff. We're including, we say, I want to include the sun. I want to include the planets. I want to include Mars's moons. I want to include Pluto and its Pluto system. I want to include the digital universe. So if you remember when we were up there, I relaunched from the messenger scene to our default scene. That's because the messenger scene didn't actually have this line in it that says request all digital universe. So open space, his engine didn't include the digital universe files into the scene. So they weren't available for us to show. So everything that you want to make available to show, you have to include in your scene file. And you'll see later that all these things that I'm including are actually asset files on the computer uh, inside the open space folder. So we say all the things we want to show up. I want to show the planets, the solar system, the universe, etc. Then I can say these key bindings, local key bindings. So I've said it that S will turn on and off certain layers and show the night texture of the Earth. I've set it up so that B will toggle the background, the stars in the Milky Way. So if you hit B, all the stars go off. And you hit B again, all the stars come back on. Why do you want that? I don't know. Someone during a presentation said, oh, I'd like to be able to show just the planet and not have the stars in the way. So you can add in just a key that will do something like that. And so for each one of the presentations that we give, we add in these different um, key files, these uh, key bindings. And um, you'll see that the key binding is actually just a series of scripts that's run when you press the key. Um, so here it's toggling on a layer on Mars. This is doing seven things all in one key. And this is an example of the Lua interaction where I have a key that then executes a series of scripts which tells the engine do something. Um, so um, then here I'm including a couple more assets, but instead of just including them up top like I did there, I actually created a variable for it so that I could then reference that variable later. So here you're going to see in the on initialize, I'm going to use this earth asset that I, that I included here. So on initialize, this is what's going to happen when this scene is loaded. It's going to set the time to now, right? Uh, certain scenes want to set the time to three years ago. If I'm visualizing the Mars rover and when it first arrived on Mars, I want to set the time back to 2011 or 13 or whatever year it was when Curiosity landed. So in the default scene, we set time to now. And then we actually do this trick, which is we, we actually set it back one day. And this is because we didn't actually have this um, last two months ago. But every time you open the planet, opened up open space, it defaults to show the Earth. And the Earth had missing images on it. And you said, well, I just opened the program. Is something broken? Why are the clouds not showing up on the Earth? It's missing part of it. Well, that's because that, uh, those clouds that you saw on the Earth are this temporal layer which loads in today's weather. It loads in yesterday's weather. Well, guess what? Today's weather hasn't completed yet because it's still today. So we always had this thing where you loaded up open space and half of the Earth was missing because only half of today had happened so far. So we actually cheat now and we load up yesterday. So that way we know that Earth is going to have the complete texture around it. Um, you can see I, I load in the key bindings. Um, 
I say which things are going to show up as the interesting buttons in this scene. And then I use that Earth asset to say the initial thing you're looking at is the Earth. Oh, OK. We have microphones. Awesome. Hi, uh, Brian. Um, so what's the default delay then uh, for just like data polling? Because I'm assuming you're caching or you're Well, no, querying. no. So I guess um, that there's like um, that there is no default. And what I mean there is every different piece of uh, data point or data set is handled by a different module. And that guy can decide do I load today's, do I load yesterday's, et cetera, right? So um, in, the case of the, in the case of the temporal globe browsing layer of the Earth's clouds, we know that we needed to go back to yesterday. But then if you talk about the data of that map of Mars, well, that's not actually a live data. That one is uh, a static image. So we have a set of imagery that was compiled in 2009 and we just show that over and over. So in that case, the delay is nine years and it never changes, or it only goes up, right? Um, but one of the things that we had proposed previously for the hackathon might be to add in uh, the Martian weather the same way we have the Earth weather. And so there, uh, they have pictures of the Martian dust, like uh, of the surface of Mars with the dust clouds and stuff, and you could add that in in a similar way. Well, what is the delay there? Well, that just depends on when does NASA release the data? Do they release it every five hours, every day, every week? And so each different uh, mission from NASA has different schedules of when it releases its data. So there isn't kind of really one, oh, everything comes in one week after, you know? It's different for every different data point. Um, so here uh, in our default scene, the last thing I was just mentioning is that we point it to the Earth. So that way we started the Earth. I could change this to the Mars asset, which I created up here. I could say something like uh, Mars asset, oops, sorry, dot Mars with a lower, with I think it goes like this. And then now, when I start open space, it would be pointing at Mars instead of Earth. Yeah, go ahead. Come on. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, this one is regarding the variables you're creating. Is there, so everything you're coding or configuring is local to the device. Yes. Uh, maybe you'll get there, but I'm just trying to understand. Will everything always be local to the device? Because you mentioned peer mirroring. Yes. Yeah, so, like, so, uh, so how I, I will know, show the like, Mars asset in a bit, and we'll show how the Mars asset uh, includes local stuff on the device, but then it also specifies some web URLs where things can be loaded from. Um, OK, so that's the default scene. And now I'll just look quickly at the, um, the New Horizons scene to just show how it's slightly different. So you're going to. We also have it over there, but we just weren't sure if. Uh, okay, uh, speak now or tell us later. Um, so you can see the first things are the same. I'm including these helper functions. These things are the same. So I'm in New Horizons. I also want to include the spice data. I also want to include the sun. I want to include the planets and the stars. But I'm also now including this mission of the New Horizons. Right, And then I'm setting different key bindings because when I'm giving the New Horizons presentation, I want to have keys that easily focus me on Pluto or Charon. Right? Normal people don't need a key that focuses on Pluto. When you're giving the default presentations in open space or you're talking about Mercury, why do I need a key that focuses on Pluto? I'm never going to focus on Pluto. But when you're launching in New Horizons mode and it's all about Pluto, then you want these keys that make it easy for you to give your presentation, right? Because a big part of open space is uh, visualizing it, but visualizing it to present to people, take the scientific data and present it to the public. Uh, and so we use these key bindings as a way to make our presentations more smooth. 
Uh, and you can see there's various different key bindings that do different things, and I don't need to go into like what each one does, because you can open this up and look at it if you want and see. Um, so what else does it do differently? It registers dashboard items. So uh, when I launch open space, you guys didn't see, since we were in presentation mode, you guys only saw the visual rendering. You didn't see what was on my dashboard and my menus. Uh, I, you might have heard I was telling you, oh, we're at this time, we're at 2011, May 17th. Oh, we're this far away from the thing. Well, the dashboard tells you those things. And as a presenter, you can use those things in the dashboard to say, to tell the people what's happening and what you're doing. Uh, so here, they're registering the New Horizons distance. So what is the distance of the spacecraft to Pluto? And as the mission evolves over time, you can say, oh, now we are this far away, now we are this far away, and you can use that to explain why the pictures are coming in quicker or faster, et cetera. Um, another thing, what does it do? It sets the time, right? So in the default scene, we set the time to now, but when we're launching in the New Horizon scene, we want to set the time to January 4, uh, July 14th, 2015. That was the day that it was approaching Pluto, and it's uh, at 8 o'clock, which must have been 12 hours before it approached or something like that. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, hold on, yeah, for the, for the stream. For people that may not know when a mission is occurring, is, do you have a quick lookup table so that you can go, oh, yes. Horizons is this oh, date, oh. and uh, uh, Apollo 15 was that date? I don't have that lookup table, but when you are creating this scene, right, you're putting together a bunch of assets. Those assets may be the Apollo spacecraft. And um, how are you gonna position the Apollo spacecraft around the moon? You're gonna use a NASA spice file, which they've provided, which gives the position of a craft at certain times. There are tools that can then look into those spice files to tell you what date windows are in there. And so that's how I determine those things. And um, I don't know if I have those tools loaded up on this laptop, but um, I can see. But basically, um, you kind of have to look into the data is the answer, right? And so um, we build those into the scene file so that when you launch the scene, it's already there. But if you were to create the scene file, you would have to figure that out. And, but you would probably want to figure that out anyway because when you're specifying the trail of the spacecraft, you have to specify the dates. And we might look at that. Um, so that's about it in terms of here. We're setting the focus on New Horizons instead of the Earth or instead of Mars. And it's just an example of how this scene file is slightly different than the other one because it includes different things and it sets some different properties. Yep. Hey, everybody. So I got two microphones. If you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll run over and hand one of these to you. You can just rattle off. So when you were loading the assets um, at the top of this file, yep. you had a request all and a require. Like, what's the difference? Yeah, so I, I didn't really talk about that just because it's, it's, it's a, the difference is not uh, kind of important, really. Uh, request versus require, um, it means that, require means that if the file is not present on disk, crash the program. Request means if the file's not present on disk, just ignore it. But in both cases, the file still there. Exactly. So to be honest, I don't really know why we have require. When would I want an asset that I'm including? But if it's not there, oh, no big deal. So I, you know, it, it should be there, right? If it doesn't show up, put the file there, you know? Like, what? So I don't actually, to be honest, I don't know why we even have built in this request versus require. To me, everything should be required. If you haven't provided all the assets for me to show this thing, don't, why would I show it, right? It's gonna look broken, something's gonna be wrong. So, yeah, so I don't, I, I, you know, uh, as someone new to the project, I've also been wondering why do we have this, you know? Um, okay, so that was a little bit about the scene file. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the asset file uh, which is going to look similar at first, but then you're going to see is actually quite different, right? So the asset file includes any resources that we would need. So in the case of a spacecraft asset file, it includes the, uh, the model and the textures. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick comment, really. I think the require and request thing might be a way to just prevent the crashing. 
Because when you're loading files, like it's gonna run through each line. So if yeah. you have something that's needed and it's not there, but you still want to load the next thing, maybe that's why they use request as opposed yeah, to request. Yeah, uh, that's because otherwise you wouldn't go to the next line. That's exactly so the idea. But kind of what I was getting at was like, if I'm setting up this like visualization of the New Horizons mission and I have the spacecraft going and taking the pictures. Why would I then say, oh, include this thing, but if it's not there, no big deal, just don't show it, because then I'm going to be giving my presentation and something's going to be missing. I'd almost rather it crash, so that way when I'm starting it up, I know, oh, something is missing. It's not going to be there when I present. But different people have, so it, 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 exactly what you said is why we have that. I just don't know who would want that. That's for me. Sometimes we build things in that, oh, we want this capability because, of course, you should it should be able to do that, and then you realize, well, yeah, it should be able to, but no one's actually going to do that, you know? And uh, this is a common pitfall in software engineering. You might have heard this, you aren't gonna need it thing, right? Sometimes people build stuff in that you don't need, and because we're engineers, we want to create these capabilities, and we want to make it the right way, and you know? Uh, so, there is some stuff like that. So, um, uh, let me just run through this, includes the resources, they might be synchronized, uh, the asset file defines the renderable and might include other assets. Uh, I'm just running through it because I want to show it and that it's going to make a lot more sense. So I, I put here as an example to show the constellation asset because it's a simple one. Uh, so let me show that one. So this is the constellation asset, you guys saw the constellations when I uh, turned them on. So. This uh, asset.synchronized resource. So um, when you download OpenSpace, you download a, a 150 megabyte application. It's very small. But then the first time you launch it, it synchronizes a default set of resources that you need to show the program. So these are where are the stars, the spice files, the pictures of the Earth, all the kind of stuff that you would need in the default scene. And so, in the case of the constellations, in order to show the constellations, I must include the data file of where they are, this spec file. And so, um, this thing right here tells OpenSpace, when you start, if this spec file doesn't exist on the disk, go and download it. And so, uh, the idea here is that well, we could have made a five gigabyte download instead of the 100 megabyte download. But then, what about the New Horizons? That has another three gigabytes. And what about this guy? He has another, and all of a sudden now our download is 20 gigabytes. So what we do is the first time that you use a resource, we synchronize it onto your computer. And if you are never gonna use that resource, we never download it for you. So if you are never gonna show the New Horizons spacecraft, we never download the model of it for you. And the way that that happens is the first time that you launch, including the New Horizons asset, it would have a synchronized resource that for the model, and that would download. Uh, and so when you'll see when you put OpenSpace on your computer and run it, the first time it's going to download four gigabytes of stuff. Then the next time it's going to download zero gigabytes until you switch scenes. So synchronizing the resource is an important part of any asset, um, and then here we can see the actual specification of the renderable. So this is, a, basically I've said I'm including this resource and now I'm going, to, I have something that I want to show on the screen. In the case of the constellations, I'm gonna show this thing which is a renderable DU mesh. What is that? Well, that's just what they called something that shows the stars and shows in the plane of the stars. DU stands for digital universe. So by default, it's it's not enabled. So all these things are the different properties, and these things will show up in the menu of things that you can adjust. So by enabled, false. So when I launch OpenSpace, the constellations are not showing. The way that I showed them was I went into the menu and I, set, I clicked on the checkbox for enabled, and it set this value to true, and now it showed up. So everything that you see here is a property that then shows up in the GUI. And how do you know what properties are available for what type? Well, the renderable type specifies which properties it has. So when you, uh, either you will look at other assets of that type. 
So when you want to see what properties can I set for a spacecraft, you'll look at a different spacecraft file, see what did they have, and you'll include those things. Or if you want, you can go into the documentation of the module for spacecraft and see what it specifies of the different properties. But more often than not, you will look at another example file. What's, what's unit referencing in this case? The units of the renderings or, uh, or no, the device? No, I actually have no clue, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to see some of those that's like, ooh, you know, the only guy who knows what this is is the guy who wrote the module. Or, in fact, I would say that we can probably look in the documentation for renderable DU mesh, and it should tell us. Can the line graphics be drawn in perspective? Say you're close to an orbit, and that orbit looks a certain width in the, in the view, but narrows in the distance the same with So, I mean, you, we do, if, you, uh, if we look at an asset for a uh, orbit trail, it has a thickness that you can set. However, I don't know if the module for a renderable orbit has the capability to set the width of the trail based upon the distance from the camera. And so what I, like, my short answer would be no, but my, I gave that long answer to kind of explain how that capability would be added in. So we have a module that looks at an asset file when it sees the type of renderable orbit trail. It then looks for a property called line width and then it knows how thick to draw the line. But someone could go into that module and in the draw method look at the camera position and say, if you're this far away, like the, the width should be a multiple of the distance of the camera. And so while that's not something we have now, that's the type of thing that you could extend by editing the module itself. And for, to be honest, maybe that capability is in the module. I've never seen it, right? Um, so then the last kind of thing that a uh, asset file specifies is where it should show up in the menus. So here, the constellations show up under Milky Way, but you'll see later a planet shows up under planets, so, uh, solar system, planets, the name of the planet. The spacecraft might show up under missions, the name of the mission, the name of the spacecraft. Um, and I'll show, I just wanted to show this constellation file because it's just a small one chunk, but I'll show a spacecraft file uh, coming up. Um, so, okay, now let's go back to here. Um, okay, so the SPICE data, I just talked about it a lot of times. I just kind of wanted to bring this in just to briefly mention what it, you know, it's their acronym. This is the data files that NASA produces that gives this spacecraft planet instrument orientation events data. So basically, it, where was the spacecraft as given a function of time? Where is the planet? as given a function of time, right? So that's this, what they call the ephemeris data. This is like where it is, when. Then you have the instrument data. So what instruments are on the spacecraft and when are they firing? So that data is what we used in order to uh, show the view frustum of the New Horizons craft. And when it puts a picture on, we know when it's taking the picture because we have this data. It says, they took a picture at this time. They took a picture, this camera fired at this time. This camera fired at this time. This camera fired at this time. So we can use that to draw a line from the camera to the planet at the specific time. Uh, the C file is the C matrix. It's the orientation of the spacecraft, right? If you are visualizing the spacecraft it, orbiting around a planet, you don't want the camera pointing away from the planet because then it's, it looks wrong, right? The heat shield has to be facing the sun. Well, how do I know how to rotate the spacecraft so that the heat shield is always facing the sun? Well, guess what? NASA provided us with the exact rotation of the spacecraft at any given time. And so it includes all these different types of spice kernel files, spice kernels, and I mean, Learning about the SPICE data, you could spend a year just learning all about that and figuring it out, and there's tools available. And uh, you know, I, as I joined the project, I've been learning about this stuff, and I can show you guys some stuff that I do know, and there's gonna be some stuff that I still can't figure out, and it's a, it's a complex but powerful system. Luckily, we have a SPICE engine built into open space, so kind of really all you would have to do is download the files and put the file names in the asset, and open space handles the rest. So that's really nice. Um, 
but this is all the uh, spacecraft assets are used the spice file. So now I'm going to demo the Voyager asset file to show, um, you know, you guys heard of Voyager, just to show how we put that in uh, into open space. So again, we synchronize a resource. We say that the first time they try to show the Voyager mission, please go and download the Voyager model, right? We want to show this 3D model. It's an OBJ file. Then we say, oh, also we need the spice data. We need to know where Voyager was. So uh, the default person who runs open space, it does not download the spice data for the Voyager craft because if you're not showing Voyager, why would you need to know where it was and why would you want to download this 500 megabytes of extra data? Well, you wouldn't. So it's not until you include the Voyager asset in a scene that the data would be downloaded when you launch open space. Uh, so here is where we do that kernels thing I was talking about. So we went to NASA's Spice Data website. We downloaded the kernels for um, Voyager. We included them on our server so they could be downloaded. And then we listed the ones you need. So we have the frame kernel. We have the, um, I think this is the clock kernel. This is the binary spacecraft position, more spacecraft position. Uh, this is the binary uh, pointing file. And so we specify all those files. And then we specify our asset. So uh, it's, we do an interesting thing with some of our models and spacecraft uh, because of how we are able to render models in open space. Right now, our model rendering has a somewhat of a primitive limitation in that we can't render model files using the regular uh, MTL material textures that you might get if you just exported something from Maya or from Blender. We can actually only render models uh, with one texture file, like a PNG texture file attached to it. So uh, what we'll do sometimes if we have a model that has multiple textures, we either have to take those multiple textures and bake them into one file, or we can separate the model into three pieces and then each one gets its own texture, and then we can tell the asset file, move all these three pieces uh, together. So that way, they look like they're one model, but it's actually three models that are all moving together. And I believe that that is what happens here, which is why I mentioned that. So if we look at this Voyager here, we're not actually specifying a model file, and that's because this is this invisible node that gets moved around and all the model files get attached to this invisible node and they move around with it. So here, we specify a spice translation. What that means is move this spacecraft in space via the spice data and the target, so go in the spice data and look for Voyager 1 and move it with respect to the sun. So an important thing about uh, the spice data is uh, this concept of uh, the where is the position in respect to? So I learned this lesson when I was um, including the Apollo 8 spice data. We were visualizing the Apollo 8 mission and as it goes around the moon. So when I first loaded the file, you would see its trail from the Earth to the moon. And then you saw this like wave of these circles. And the, the moon was here and these waves of the circles were moving around the moon. And I said, wait, like, What's going on? This is weird, right? And basically, it was the concept of if you're looking from the Earth, the moon is moving. So uh, those orbits were actually moving with the moon as it moved in respect to the Earth. But then when I visualized the trail with respect to the moon, all of a sudden, all the orbits were tight circles around the moon. But then, as time progressed, the Earth moved away from the beginning of the trail. And I was like, wait, I, I got detached. But it's this concept of an orbit around the moon. It, if you take a fixed piece of string and then the Earth moves, but that initial starting point of where it started is still the same place. So the Earth has moved away from it. Or when I was reviewing with respect to Earth, the, the moon was moving through these orbits. And it was, it was a really an amazing realization for me, but it was also a lesson to be learned about the spice data of what is this concept of the orientations and the, the transformations. 
Go ahead. Yeah. So for uh, like all the spice data, that is historical data, effectively. Uh, correct, except there is uh, certain things like the planets. They pre-calculated it, right. and then certain things like missions. They will actually create a pre-mission spice file. So where they think it's going to be and where they're planning on sending it. So for something like Voyager, for example, that's historical. But it does include where it is now. So if, if I launch this scene, I started in 1971, but I can press now, and it shoots Voyager all the way out there. But if you want to visualize where it will be in 10 years, exactly. you so, have to do the telemetry for that? Correct. And the spice kernel may or may not include that. If it doesn't include that, and I jump 10 years, then you'll actually see this error showing up in the log that says, uh, unable to uh, calculate position for body Voyager at time, blah, blah, blah. Basically, it's telling we've gone outside of the calculated range. So it would be interesting, actually, for me to go look at that spice file for Voyager and see how far does it go. Because I know I've jumped to now, or I jumped to now a month ago, and I saw it, and I said, holy crap, it's out there, you know? So, yeah. So... Yeah, the question was, how many missions can you run simultaneously? So the short answer is one. And the long answer is maybe you could run five, and I just don't know. So the reason that I say that is that uh, right now when you uh, launch the application, you specify which mission you want to show. However, we do have some code, I just haven't really messed with it, that would theoretically let you load another mission into the current mission and be showing both at once. Or you could easily just take all of the asset files for all the missions and include them into one mega scene. And then you have everything at once as one super mission. So um, if you cheated and did that, you could load them all up as many as you want and then you know, if you put in too many things, maybe your frame rate is slow because your computer is slow. But there's also this concept of um, right now all the assets are loaded at start, but we do have some scripting capabilities that will let you dynamically add assets at runtime. However, they are a little more untested, I would say. I've seen them used before, but when I tried it once, stuff just died, and I was like, I don't have time to mess with this. Um, so. Here, I'm going to go back to Voyager, and uh, I'm talking about how it was positioned. Same thing goes for the rotation. Basically, um, I'm rotating this Voyager 1 spacecraft, and uh, that's the frame I look for in the spice kernel, and I say rotate it in terms of the galactic plane. And then I say, now take this thing and put it in the menu under Solar System Missions Voyager 1. But now, you're going to see the the renderables. So this is the model of the Voyager spacecraft. So the other thing was this invisible node that I'm going to attach three different models to and make it look like one spacecraft. So the first one is the Voyager main. So here, I, what I do is I have this parent. And so that says, I'm not going to give you any type of position data for this thing. But I'm telling you that its parent is the other thing that I specified. So basically, position and do everything to this guy basically put him inside the other guy and he'll handle, right? If I put this cup inside of a box and then I move the box, the cup moves with the box. That's what's going on here. So I haven't said where to put it and when because I'm telling you where to put the box and that will handle moving the cup. So um, uh, this is a renderable, it's a renderable model. It's a multi-model geometry, so renderable model is one of the renderable types that's exposed by one of our modules. So the modules create renderable types that can then be used in asset files. So open space loads up a scene, the scene includes an asset file, the asset file says, I have this renderable, and then the actual module code draws it onto the screen. I know I'm like, already said that stuff, but I'm trying to, just trying to reiterate it to uh, include it. Um, and then here I have the antenna. So I had the ship, I have the antenna, and I think that was it. In fact, this is just two. And this model is made up of one model and the antenna, but you'll see some other spacecraft are made up of three or four or five things. Um, 
So then what I also include in the Voyager asset is the, the trail. So uh, you heard me talking about the trail before. This is another different type of renderable. It's a renderable trail trajectory. You saw that blue, um, you saw that blue line that was uh, the trail of um, the messenger spacecraft. And so that is how I do that. So I give it, again, the same type of positioning. I give it a color. I tell it when did it start and end. And then that's how it knows when to draw it and where. Um, and you know, here I have it for Voyager going from Earth to Jupiter. And then I have from uh, going around Jupiter. Then I have it going from Jupiter to Saturn. And this is how NASA included the data files. So I'm going to just try to um, speed myself up a little bit because I'm talking about a lot of stuff. So the modules, so I talked about the assets, and the assets are rendered by the modules. So they provide the functionality of rendering. Um, I kind of maybe already talked about all this stuff, but one of the main key points is that these modules are added all the time by our master's students doing their thesis. So every year we get a few new module types that add new types of rendering capabilities. Um, and so the key, Another key point there is some modules are not available as part of the main release. That's because a student might have done their work on it, and it's cool, and it's amazing, and we want to show it, but the code maybe isn't fully up to par with our coding standards, or maybe its functionality breaks a different piece of functionality. So after they finish the modules, then there's a certain amount of time that we have to take to massage those modules into our main code base. So in the case of the Gaia stars, if you wanted to see how we render the Gaia data set, you'd actually have to check out a different branch of our thing, build open space with that module enabled, and then show that. Why do we do that? Well, because it turns out that you can't render Gaia and the Earth atmosphere at the same time. And until we figure that out, we're going to have to bring, we're gonna, like once we figure that out, then we can bring the Gaia module into the main code base. Um, and so there's a couple interesting modules that we have available that if you download an open space, wouldn't be there in the download, but you could find them on our GitHub or some of our wiki pages. So I will just literally for two seconds demo the module. So I'm just going to show the, um, the atmosphere module as an example. Um, basically, uh, the module extra large icons really just includes a couple of files. It includes a C++ file, which um, if I open in Sublime Text, you're going to see is incredibly small. This file just literally specifies what type of renderable. This says, I'm a module that can do renderable atmospheres. Other modules might include multiple types, but the atmosphere module just includes one type, atmosphere. And then it has code for renderable atmosphere. And then in here, you can see what is an atmosphere, and you can also see, like, this is all the code for it, but it also includes documentation of what the different properties are that this module has, that renderables of this type have. So now you know when I'm making an atmosphere, I can specify a average ground reflectance, I can specify a ground radiance emission, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, is there anything? And that's essentially a module. It, it has a piece of code that says what it is. It then includes a, a C++ class for each type of renderable, and then it includes any necessary shaders that you need to do the OpenGL rendering. Um, I will kind of maybe just leave it at that in the interest of time. And I did want to just show briefly that it, I showed that kind of documentation that was in the code. But uh, we actually have an engine that goes through the code files and generates HTML pages based upon those comments in the code files. And so if we look under here, you know, uh, you can see some of these different things. And you can see uh, maybe this other guy is a better one. Um, and so you can kind of see what the different uh, values are. So this is the one that we saw for the constellations. It was a renderable DU mesh. Well, what type of things do you set for a renderable DU mesh? You could look in the C++ file, or you could look here, and you can see, oh, it has a transparency. It has a color. Does it want to draw the labels or not? It has a text color. And so uh, 
we make sure that this is like one of the examples of like maybe the student file didn't include the documentation, so we have to write that in before we want to include it in our main thing. But all of the the classes should have this documentation associated with it. Um, okay. Back to this guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so just briefly, like the C++, if you were going to be building your own modules, these are some of the tools you would use. Obviously, you're going to get the code from GitHub. We use CMake to configure the build file, whether it's for Visual Studio or for Xcode or for some Linux build environment. I don't know what people are using on Linux these days, code blocks. Code light, whatever it is, but basically you you run the CMake on Mac and it generates an Xcode file. You run the CMake on Windows, it generates a Visual Studio file, and that's what you can use to actually build the thing. Um, it, for people who are interested in that, I can show it's really just a couple of clicks, and then boom, you have it up and running. Uh, but I won't go into too much details past that. Um, so here I just said some notable modules. The Globe Browsing module is one of our big modules. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how it works. It uses GDAL and the, um, it shows, it adds layers to the renderable globes. It, we have two different types of layers. I mentioned the web map loaded layers, uh, the web loaded layers versus the local layers. So the web loaded ones are come from these WMS files. The local ones are the VRT files. Uh, the data format for the globe browsing is the format of GeoTIFF, which is a combination of the TIFF file format, image format, combined with geospatial information. And there's a lot of different tools around extracting and manipulating the geospatial information there. Uh, we use the GDAL tools. Um, there is another uh, more in-depth uh, set of tools called the AIM Stereo Pipeline, which comes from NASA. This is uh, taking the raw data files from, uh, like the images from the, that were taken by the spacecraft and creating these digital terrain models and stuff out of, uh, out of those files. Um, that's, uh, we have a series of students at the museum who do that kind of work, but that's a similar type of thing that you could do. Hey, we noticed there's another site on Mars we want to show. You don't have it in open space. You can go download the raw files from NASA's PDS, run them through this AIM stereo pipeline and get it to show up. Um, so I have uh, all sorts of links and stuff about how to include data with the Globe browsing module. Uh, I just wanted to quickly show the Mars asset file. Um, so, if we look at, um, oh, I was going to show Moon, not Mars. So, the Moon it has the similar thing of its spice translation, but it's a renderable globe. That's, that's a renderable type that's exposed by the globe browsing module. It, a renderable globe has these different variables, and one of the key variables are these color and height layers. So, here we are specifying Ah, this is a map of the moon that I can show, the wide-angle camera that I mentioned. And what we're saying is get the HTTP information from here in this folder under WAC.WMS. And if I were to open that, which I don't think I included here, you would basically just see it's an XML file that lists a URL to download the tiles from, and it lists like the size, how many tiles are available. Um, and you can see for the moon, we are listing all these different layers that we have available. And then we do the same thing for height layers, all the different, the Lola one that I talked about. Um, and we can say where does the shadow come from, and then we give it a path in the GUI, and then we export it. So the key part of the globe browsing, of the globe asset file is what layers are available. Um, so let's go back to here. Uh, maybe I will skip this. This was going to show an example of the files that you would create for adding like the Apollo 5 landing site. I'll leave that for when somebody actually wants to do it. We can go into the depth in depth there. Uh, the Gaia module is a module that I talked about. So I said the Globe browsing module is a notable one. The Gaia module is one that has become popular in the last year because people keep asking, do you have Gaia? How do I show that? Um, 
Obviously, our GUI module is kind of important because without it, we'd have no menu. And then we have our web GUI module, which is the new version that shows it um, with a nice uh, web rendered interface. Um, so aside from the asset files uh, and the C++ modules, I had identified a couple other things like web development. So you could either work on our web GUI or you can make your own web pages that could control open space and either function as a GUI for open space or an alternative type of GUI for a different type of thing. So um, perhaps you want to make a web page that um, would have six buttons on it, and then when open space is running, you can just press one of those six buttons and it would do six very simple things, like you want to make the kids interface for open space. You could use our web technology interface to do that. Um, the socket API is actually what the web inter is what the web GUI technology uses. So basically we have a socket in open space that you can either pull data from or push data into. It, there's really we don't have too much documentation for it yet, but I can show people how the web uh, browser uses it, but it can be used for an interesting thing like a Raspberry Pi, right? So if you wanted to make, uh, like one of the things I was thinking would be real interesting is like, let's just say you had nine buttons, one for each planet, hooked up to a Raspberry Pi and they had colors, and you press a button and you want open space to then show that planet. The Raspberry Pi could use the socket interface to be connected to open space. Whenever you press a button, it then sends an event over the web socket, tells open space, focus on the thing that I pressed the button for. And so I think the socket API is, could be a real interesting avenue to do stuff in the hackathon. Um, Spout is another one that I mentioned. So basically, this is the concept. You're using open space, and instead of showing the graphics on your monitor, you're sending the graphics to another program. That program might be a projection mapping software that they use to show those cool projections on buildings. Maybe it's a computer vision software in open frameworks that identifies the stars and highlights them or does something fancy with them. There's actually really interesting things you could do here that I haven't even thought of. We use it to do a 360 video recording using this uh, world viewer software that can take in our fisheye and output it as a 360 video. Um, so while we haven't done much with the spout, I think there are some interesting things that can be done there. Uh, I included some miscellaneous things like scripting. I, I talked a bit about how the interaction works by executing Lua scripts, but there could be some real interesting things you could do by combining sets of Lua scripts that then call other Lua scripts, and you can create some really interesting, uh, like either demos or uh, things like, you know, I made a really interesting educational thing where you just press G and all the planets get scaled by 4,000% so that when you're looking at the solar system, you can see, like, oh, this is what their scale looks like, you know? Um, we have all sorts of other things that we need, like infrastructure, data updating procedures, testing, so uh, things that you might not think as part of the hackathon, but, like, uh, but these are things that are needed. Like we have um, the Mars rover data, but we only have it from 2013 to 2017. Well, what about last year's? Maybe someone, we need a, a procedure where it can go to NASA's website, download the new data every month, and then include it in open space. So while that could be something that happens outside of open space, it's still a type of hacking thing that you could do in order to bring stuff into open space. Um, I just listed out some example things I didn't want to be telling you guys what you should do in the hackathon, but I just wanted to give some examples to like show this is the type of thing you could do with some of the stuff that I showed. So uh, I mentioned the Martian weather thing that's from the Marcy camera, the Mars something, something, something. Uh, the Cassini mission visualization would be similar to our New Horizons or our, our Voyager. That's one that people have talked about doing or tried doing or whatever. The, I mentioned the solar system sculpture thing I was talking about with the buttons. Uh, one thing that someone actually did recently, but I brought it in as an interesting example, was this Python spec file creator. So basically somebody wrote a Python script, has nothing to do with open space, but it generates the asset files that open space use. So it goes to an online star database, some EU, uh, EU ESA website, downloads their databases and converts them into open spaces format. And now all of a sudden you could have a different database of stars showing up in open space. So that's a really interesting type of way to hack something into open space, but they actually didn't code anything in open space or use any open space code. They wrote their own Python code that just generates an asset file that open space uses. Um, so that is my last slide. Yeah. I have three questions. Great. 
the Python spec file creator, is that something that's available on GitHub? Do you know? Yeah, it is, it okay, is. Cool. Yeah, I have the link in, right in here in my speaker yeah, notes. Yeah, if, if you can ping us the link yeah. like on the open space Slack or something. The second thing is um, um, f during the hackathon, while we are using it, if we need help with open space. Oh, I will be here the whole hackathon. Oh, okay. Well, awesome. AI, yeah, exactly. I don't know 100% if I'm gonna sleep here Saturday night, but I will be here Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday available for like, I will just be sitting here waiting for people to come and ask me. So okay. don't be afraid to come and ask me. And if awesome. I spend all day working with you, then I spend all day working with you. If it's 10 minutes, then it's 10 minutes. But I'm here the whole hackathon for you guys. We also have a uh, Slack team work, uh, workspace set up so we can create like an open space channel for people Perfect. to post questions. Awesome. And so you don't have to run around the entire event. Yes, yeah. dope. Perfect. Oh.